So let's talk about divine providence. Uh, what is divine providence? I think it's uh, good to start by answering that question so that we are clear of what we are talking about. So divine providence is um, the belief that there is a being out there, a powerful being, that um, provides the rules by which the universe functions and governs the universe and also provides for the beings that exist in the universe, of course, including the human beings and, and animals and plants and, and everything. That is this being that takes care of all those things and um, guides how they exist and live and, 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 uh, and uh, take care of themselves and take care of others. So that's, that's basically what uh, divine providence is. Um, it's a huge uh, topic when it comes to, especially to the question of the existence of God or non-existence of God and uh, the powers that God has or doesn't have. In the previous video, we did talk about um, we did talk about whether God the, knows us as individuals or or as a species, and how Maimonides was trying to tell us how philosophers have come to conclusions that he is not comfortable with uh, by saying that God is ignorance ignorant and that's because they've looked around and they see that there are pious people who live miserable lives and they are, on the other hand these people who are not pious but they live pleasant and happy lives and they conclude that then either god is ignorant or is incapable or he doesn't care um yeah whatever that you can watch that video if you've not watched so in this case is like the continuation of that and now we are talking about whether uh, how god manages the universe um so I'll read this. There are five, he says there are four. I think, I don't know, I, I tried to look around. I, I think this was an error in the writing. I don't know, maybe it is not. Maybe there's something I missed because he says in the very first paragraph of that chapter that there are four different theories concerning uh, divine providence. But when he lists them down, then it, we are five. So I don't know, maybe that was, or, uh, was um, an error, maybe, I don't know. Um, so he says there are four different, there are five. There are four different theories concerning divine providence. There are are all ancient, known since the time of the prophets, when the rule of the true law was revealed to the to enlighten these dark regions. Now, we're going to go through those five theories. Um, very interesting, I must say. Um, <clears throat> first theory: there is no providence at all for anything in the universe. All parts of the uni of the universe, the heavens, and what they contain, all their origin to accident and chance. There exists no being that rules and governs them or provides for them. So this is basically the atheistic uh, theory, you can call it. So where most atheists or all atheists, I guess, believe that uh, the universe came into being by a chance, by an accident, the Big Bang, and then everything else has emerged through um, evolution that has taken place in, for millions of he, he maybe billions of years, uh, likely. Uh, so there is not no one really out there. There is no being. There is no intelligence out there that has organized anything. Everything has happened by chance. Everything um, has evolved uh, by chance. So that that falls into the first theory that he explains to us the theory of of providence. He continues. This is the theory of Epicurus. Epicurus is mentioned so many times in, in the book, and I think Epicurus must have been a very um, well known. Um, I can call him atheist, maybe they didn't call him so during that time. Um, so he says it's a theory that is pushed, was pushed by Epicurus. I might try to see if I can find text written by this guy, Epicurus. Uh, so he says this is the theory of Epicurus who assumes also that the universe consists of atoms, that these have combined, have combined by chance and have received their various forms by mere accident. There have been atheists among the Israelites who have ex expressed the same view it is reported of them, they've denied the Lord and said he is not. So, and although this is, it's coming to my mind, but this is something I might talk about when I, I talk about the book I'm currently reading. Uh, it's the book by Baruch Spinoza, and it's kind of like an antidote of Maimonides' book. It kind of like gave us the opposite view of that. Um, uh, and um, when I, as I was reading that book, it occurred to me that I had a very simplistic understanding of the ancient Jewish um, society after reading the Bible. Um, it turns out it was a complex society, and now reading this, it makes sense after reading that book when it says there were atheists in the ancient Jewish state or society. And, and in fact, they are the ones who are mentioned in the book of Jeremiah um, 5, verse 12 where he says, they have denied the Lord and said, he is not. Uh, he continues, Aristotle proved the absurdity of the theory 
that the whole universe could have originated by chance, he has shown that on the contrary, contrary, there is a being that rules and governs the universe. We have already touched upon this subject in the past, the present treatise. So he, he, he says that this theory has been, was debunked by Aristotle, who through his logical argument came to the conclusion that there must have been a, a, an intelligence out there that organized things the way they are, because the way things looked, or looked at least to Aristotle, it didn't seem like there was any way that they were by chance. So that's the first theory. The second theory, um, why is one part of the universe owes its existence to providence and is under the control of a ruler and a governor, another part is abandoned and left to chance? So this is a very interesting um, theory. Uh, this is the argument that it's like the middle of, 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 it's like standing in the middle of there is no ruler and there is a ruler. So it's basically saying some parts of the universe are ruled and governed by a being. God, if you like, but there's other parts of the universe that are abandoned, basically, and nobody's ruling over them. This is the view of Aristotle about providence, and I will now explain to you the, his theory. So it turns out this is the uh, what Aristotle uh, thought. He thought that the universe was governed, some part of it was governed by God, and some were basically abandoned. He holds that God controls the spheres and what they contain. And in fact, the word spheres here is, is very carefully used because the ancient uh, and up until the time of, of Maimonides, they, they thought of the universe as being of spheres. Uh, they, of course, right now we can say of the same, but they are not really the same thing. Um, um, therefore, the individuals being in the spheres remain permanently in the same form. Alexander has also expressed it in his writing that divine providence extends down to and ends with the sphere of the moon. This so basically this theory divide, divides the universe into different spheres and, and, and the providence, some held that the providence ended with the moon so that below the moon it was like kind of free will of the people and the beings that were there. So that's the argument he's trying to make that above the moon there are the beings there or the objects there had to act following specific rules but under the moon, yeah, we have free will. He believes that providence is in accordance with the nature of the universe. Consequently, in the case of, of the spheres with their contents, where each individual being has a permanent existence, providence gives permanence and constancy. So the argument is, is because of providence that any, any other or any object or being that is under uh, divine providence is permanent and is constant. The moon, the sun, the stars, they live forever. But those that are not under uh, divine providence in, now those below the moon they don't have that permanency and constant con constancy that's the according to the second theory from the existence of the spheres another beings derive existence which are constant in their species but not in their individuals in the same manner it is said that providence sends forth from the spheres to the earth sufficient influence to secure the immortality and constancy of the species without securing the same time permanency for the individual beings of the species. This is a very interesting argument because it's basically arguing that we get defined providence as a species, but not as individuals. Uh, and because the species gets the divine providence, the species will always be there. And because the individual doesn't get the divine providence, the, the, the individual doesn't live forever. And thinking about it, um, the species lives because there are rules in nature that makes the species to continue being there. Uh, the mating, pregnancy, giving birth. Those are rules that are completely out of our control, but they exist. And those rules um, ensure that the species continues being around. But the individual who has the free will um, doesn't. That's according to this second theory. Um, but the individual being in each species have not been entirely abandoned though. Okay. That portion of the material prima which has been purified and refined has received the faculty of growth is endowed with the properties that enable it to exist a certain time to attract what is useful and to repent what is useless. That portion of material prima which has been, sub which has been subject to a further development and has received the faculty of sensation is endowed with other properties for its protection and preservation and has a new faculty of moving freely towards 
that which is conducive to and away from that which is contrary to its, its well-being. So he says the individual is not completely abandoned. Uh, we still have this ability to, to, to determine what can make us live longer and have healthy life and what can harm us. And there's a line here that is, it comes up at this point, which came, comes up a lot in the book. And it's this idea that all of us, the, all the movement of living things, including humans, are only of two kinds. The movement towards what is beneficial to us and the movement from what is painful to us. That's all movements are about that. And I was thinking and I'm like, that's true. All the movement we do while we are alive are of those two kinds. Moving towards what is beneficial to us and moving away from what is painful to us. Each individual being receives besides such properties, each be each individual being received besides such properties as are required for the preservation of the species to which it belongs. The portion of the prima which the portion of the prim material prima which is still more refined and is endowed with intellectual faculty possesses a special property by which each individual, according to the degree of his perfection, is enabled to manage, calculate, and to discover what is conducive both for the temporary existence of the individual and for the preservation of the species. All other movements, however, which are made by the individual member of each, of each species are due to accident. They are not according to Aristotle, the results of the rule and management. Uh, where, so, yeah, so there are these movement from good, movement towards good, and movement away from bad. And this, he says, is part of the divine providence, according to this theory. But then other movements that might happen are by accident. So they are not part of the divine providence. This is according to this second theory. Um, E.g., when a storm or gale blows, it causes undoubtedly some leaves of a tree to drop, break off some branches of another tree, tear away a stone from a heap of stone, raise dust over herbs, spoil them and stab the sea so that the ship go down with the whole part of their content. Um, yeah, so these other movements are by accident. It's important, this, it's important to note this because when we move to another, um, another theory, there is this big question of um, between whether every movement is the will of God and whether some are not. And it is about, of course, the divine providence. And as he was explaining, he was explaining some of the aspects where uh, the, the, of the, of the uh, areas where Islam and, and Jewish beliefs differ and Christianity differ. And one of those is in regard to divine providence. For example, when Muslims talk about anything, there is this word of inshallah. And as I was reading this book, it made it became clear to me that inshallah is not just a word; it's it's it's, it's a it's a it's a doctrine. It's a, it's the foundation. It's part of the foundation of Islamic teaching. Inshallah, which means the will of basically the will of God. Like even when a, a, a leaf falls down from a tree, is inshallah, it's the will of God. But some of these uh, theories are against that they say. For example, in this second we are that there are some that are, some are not. So, um, so he says, uh, the, 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 for Aristotle, the things like a falling of a leaf or, or a stone being falling or, or a ship being wrecked by a storm at sea, those are accidental movement. They, they have nothing to do with divine, divine providence. Um, so I'll continue reading where was I? Um, so, and, and if you die from such movement, it's by accident. That's according to the second theory. In short, the opinion of Aristotle is this. In short, the opinion of Aristotle is this. Everything is the result of man management which is constant, which does not come to an end and does not change any of its properties, e.g. the evenly beings. And everything which continues according to certain rules and deviates from it only rarely and exceptionally, as in the case with objects of nature. All these are results of management, divine providence. But that which, so according to Aristotle, things that don't change are managed by divine providence. That is how the universe is functioning. And also the rules of nature, are divine providence. But other things that are outside that and they change, they are not part of divine providence. But that which is not constant, now, but that which is not constant does not follow a certain rule, e.g. incidence in the existence of the individual being in each species of land or animal, 
whether rational or is irrational, is due to chance and not management, not divine providence. Um, it is not really, it is not, it, it, it is in no relation to divine providence. Aristotle, Aristotle holds that it is even impossible to ascribe the providence, providence, the management of these things. With these views closely connected with the theory of the eternity of the universe and with this opinion that everything different from the existing order of things in nature is impossible, it is the belief that of those who turned away from the reports are happened. So from this second theory, what we, we, we pick out is that and it, it seems like this is the theory that was pushed a lot by Aristotle, is that divine providence applies to things that are permanent and things that follow laws of nature. Anything else is not divine providence. Anything else is, is chance and will, individual will for humans and animals and chance for things like wind and, and, and storm and things like that. Let's move to the that theory. The that theory that theory is the reverse of the second. According to this theory, there is nothing in the whole universe, neither class or individual, that is due to chance. Everything is the result of will, intention, and rule. It is the matter, it is a matter of course, that he who rules must know, that which is under his control. So this is this is now the third theory is the theory under which the Islamic teachings is based on. Uh, and is now where the inshallah was mentioning comes in that everything that happens is the will of God. There is nothing like his chance. There is nothing like um, we can we can basically say everything is divine providence. Basically, like everything is handled and ruled by God. There is nothing that is is outside God's will. Basically, uh, he says uh, um, Muhammad and Asharia are there to this theory. Notwithstanding, okay, I'm not going to read that part. It might not be appropriate. Uh, they admit that Aristotle is, a, is correct in assuming one and the same cause, the wind, for the, the fall of leaves from a tree and for the death of a man drawn, drawn in the sea. So for this, if you die in, at sea, maybe you were in a ship and there was a storm and you died, is the will of God. Meanwhile, Aristotle on his side thinks it's accident. Um, but they hold at the same time that the wind did not blow by chance. It is God that caused it to move. It is there. It is not there for the wind that caused the leaves to fall. Each leaf fall according to the defined de decree. It is God who caused it to fall a certain time and a certain place. It could not have been fallen before or after time or in another space, another place. It, is, as it, it has previously been decreed. So that's that's the the theory that. Uh, Islamic teaching basically um, uh, is based on, and the, is the, uh, as far as defined providence is concerned, that everything happens according to the will of God, including the falling of a leaf and, and a stone falling or a storm at sea and things like that. I think I'm not going to read the rest part of that because it's more or less the same being talked about. Okay, the fourth theory, man has free will. Um, it is therefore intelligible that the law contains commands and prohib prohibitions with announcements of reward and punishment. So the fourth theory is about uh, giving man the free will, and not only man, but all the other animals, that they have the free will. Whatever they do is not predetermined by any being, God or whoever. Uh, these are things they can just do, that if you are just sitting right now, there is nobody who is going to determine when you stand where you are going. It is going to happen because you decide so. And it's also here that now we are talking about reward and punishment, that now our behavior or our actions are, are, are going to be determined by what we get or the pain that is going to come. Um, and, and also reading this part right now, I'm also going back to the book I told you I'm reading at the moment uh, by Baruch Spinoza. And he talks about reward and punishment. Uh, in a very interesting way, and, and I saw how he, he, they are so important in our existence as, as human societies. Anyway, that's another a story for another day. So all acts of God are due to wisdom. No injustice is found in him, and he does not afflict the good. The Mutazila profess this theory. So the Mutazila is a particular school of Islamic teaching, I think, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, might confirm the Mutazila. Is, they are mentioned a lot in the book, and my assumption has always been is a school of Islamic teaching. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it means something else. Um, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a teaching. It's a, it's a particular teaching of of Islam. It says they profess this theory, and although they do not believe in man's absolute 
uh, they profess this theory, although they do not believe in man's absolute free will. So while they, uh, they, they, they accept this theory, they don't go all the way and say that man has absolute free will. They also hold that God takes notice of the falling of the leaf and the destruction of an ant, and that his providence extends over all things. This theory likewise implies contradiction and absurdities. The absurdities are this. The fact that some persons are born with defects, although they have not sinned previously, is ascribed to, to the wisdom of God. It's, it's, it's it being better for those persons to be in such than to be in normal state. So, while the, the argument is about reward and, and, and punishment, that good deeds lead to, 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 to rewards and bad deeds lead to punishment, and these guide the, the, the actions of people, uh, then, of course, there are absurdities that uh, crop up. For example, if, if bad things are going to happen to me because of my bad decisions, then how do you explain people who are born with, uh, uh, with di disabilities, for example? Um, uh, and then their argument in that case becomes there is a way that God saw it and God thought it's better for them to be born in that state than be born being, you can say, normal. Um, so uh, they do not suffer there by any partition, but on the contrary, enjoy God's good. In a similar manner, the slot of, of the pious is explained as being for them the source of increased reward in future. So the same thing, even though we are talking about reward and punishment, that you have free will and your good deeds lead to reward and your bad deeds lead to punishment, then the question also arises, what is happening when people who are pious are murdered? What is happening there? And he says those who hold, who, 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 who hold um, or who, who go by this theory, then for them they are like, when you, you are pious and you, you suffer um, an injustice, you may, you may call it so, it's like you, you have a reward to correct that in the life after. They go even further in the absurdity. Maimonides calls them absurdities. I don't know whether that's the right way to characterize it. Um, we ask them why God only, why is God only just to man and not other beings? And how has the irrational animal sinned that it is condemned to be slaughtered? So those are the questions that you will be asked when you, you hold this, uh, you, you believe in this theory of uh, reward and punishment and free will. That my good deeds leads to reward, my bad deeds lead to the punishment then of course you'd be like what does does that apply only to humans does it apply to other animals and if it does apply to other animals what has an animal done to be slaughtered things like that so that's the second um the third uh, is it the that the, the fourth sorry uh there's more that he talks about when when you read the book about that i'm not going to read everything the fifth theory this is our theory that's not me i mean my money is calls it his theory, and I guess he means our theory, Jewish teachings. So he says, this is our theory or that of our law. I will show you first the view expressed on this subject in our prophetical books and generally accepted by our sages. I will then give the opinion of some, I'll then give the opinion of some latter authors amongst us. And lastly, I will explain my own belief. The theory of man perfectly free will is one of the fundamental principles of the law of our teacher Moses and of those who follow the law. According to this principle, man does what is in his power to do by his nature, his choice, and his will. Now, this is not very far from the fourth, which is by the Mutazila, certain uh, teachings of the Islam. Uh, but now the difference is with this fifth theory, which is basically the Jewish teaching, man has complete free will, complete free will. Um, and he says, and action is not due to any faculty created for the purpose. All species of irrational, all species of irrational animals are likewise moved by their own free will. And this free will is goes to all the other animals as well. <clears throat> this is the will of God, that is to say, it is due to the eternal divine will that all living beings should move freely and that man should have power to act according, according to his will or choice within the limits of his capacity. Again, as this principle, we hear that God, no opposition on the part of our nation. Another, no, I read that again. We hear that, sorry, against this principle, we hear, thank God, no opposition on the part of our nation. Another fundamental principle taught by the law of Moses is this. Wrong cannot be ascribed to God in any way whatsoever. 
all evils are uh, and afflictions as well as all kinds of of happiness to man, whether they concern one individual person or a community, are distributed according to justice. They are the results of strict judgment that admits no wrong, whatever. So, uh, so um, there is, it seems like in this case, providence is not guided by um, acts of people, as in the other um, in the other theory. Uh, but the people have free will to do what they want to do, but they have to accept the repercussions of that. I think that's what I'm getting from this part. Even when a person suffers pain in consequence of a thorn have, having entered in, into his hand, although it is at once drawn out, it is punishment that has been inflicted on him for sin, and the least pleasure he enjoys is a reward for some good. Um, all this is meted out by strict justice. So. I don't see much difference between this and the previous theory. It's like it's still reward punishment. Maybe the previous theory, there are some element of divine providence, meaning God controlled a few things. But in this case, there is no God controlling anything, really. It's just people doing whatever they want to do, but there's reward and punishment. The different theories, okay, now it concludes that it says the different theories are now fully explained to you. Uh, everything in the in the varying human affairs is due to chance. There is that, according to Aristotle. To the divine will alone, according to Asharia, Islamic teaching. To the divine wisdom, according to the Mutazila. To the merits of man, according to the Jewish. So that's basically a summary of it. That according to Aristotle, um, everything that happens to a human being is by chance. According uh, Yes, and according to the Asharia, everything that happens to person is, inshallah, according to the will of God. And uh, according to the Mutazila, which is another teaching of Islam, like it's a bit different, divine wisdom according, um, it says, uh, will, the divine will according to the Asharia, to the divine wisdom according to the Mutazila, to the merits of man according to the Jewish. Um, now, Let's see what he says. Uh, I, I decided to, to include, so I talk about this part where he gives his own opinion. My opinion on this principle of divine providence, I will now explain to you. In the principle which I now proceed to expound, I do not rely on demonstrative proof, but on my conception of the spirit of the law and the writings of the prophets. The principle which I accept is far less open to objections and is more reasonable than the opinions mentioned before. It is this. In the lower sublunary portion of the universe, where the earth is, divine providence does not extend to the individual members of the species except in the case of mankind. Now, Maimonides gives his own, I'll say, different perspective compared to the other five that he has given us according to different uh, teachings. Now he tells us, him personally, uh, he believes that divine providence does not extend to the individual members of species, except in the case of mankind. He says, in the case of man, every other animal does not get divine providence, uh, but only mankind. It's only in these species that the incidents in the existence of the individual beings, they are good, Evil fortunes are the results of justice in accordance with the words, for all his ways are judgment. That's a facile he, he, he quotes. But I agree with Aristotle as regard to all other living things and uh, for theory as regards plants and all the rest of earthly creatures. For I do not believe that it is through the interference of divine providence that a certain leaf drops from a tree. So he's basically saying he doesn't agree with the teaching of, of Asharia that it's an inshallah for everything. It's not inshallah for everything, according to him. Some of it is accidental. Uh, nor do I hold that when a certain spider catches a certain fly, that it is the direct result of special decree and will of God in that moment. It is not by particular divine decree that the spittle of a certain person moved, fell on a certain nut in a certain place, and killed it. Nor is it by direct will of God that certain fish catches a, catches a, catches Swal and swallows a certain worm on the surface of the water. In all these cases, the action is, according to my opinion, entirely due to chance. 
as taught by Aristotle. Divine providence is connected with divine intellectual influence and same things which are benefited by the latter so as to become intellectual and to comprehend things comprehensible to rational beings are also under the control of divine intelligence, div divine providence, sorry, which examines all their deeds in order to reward or to punish them. To punish them. It may be by mere chance that a ship, a ship goes down with all contents, as in the above mentioned instance, or that the, the roof of a house falls upon those within, but it's also due to chance, according to our view. I'll repeat that. He says, um, he says, it, is, it may be by mere chance that a ship goes down without contents, as in the above mentioned, says, or the roof falls down upon, but it's also due to chance, according to our view, that in the one instance the men went into the ship or remained in the house, it's due to... The, so, the, we, have, we have this scenario of you went, you boarded a ship, it went into the sea, there is a storm, and it is wrecked and you die. Now, Maimonides is arguing there is divine providence involved, but there is also chance involved, such that chance is, exists in the case of the storm arising and the ship getting wrecked. But he says there is divine providence in you leaving the house and boarding the ship. Kind of interesting. So that's, that's what, there's a lot more that Maimonides says about divine providence. We just decided to read those parts. If you get the book yourself, you read and you'll find a lot more arguments he makes.